Lab exercise three doesn't have nearly the material as some of the other labs have, but seems like students have more trouble with it because you're doing something you've never done before. So down here in your instructions, it says, on this exam, you may be asked to give the name, the location, and or the function of the tissues that we're going to be studying here. So we're going to look at epithelial tissues, which are your skin cells, and you have skin on the outside of your body, and you have skin on the inside of your body. So most people don't realize that. And then connective tissue. So that would be like blood. And there are two other kinds of tissues that are muscle and nerve, but we're not going to study those in this particular lab exercise. We're going to catch up with those in a later lab. So you're only going to have to look at 12 tissues and know them, know where they are and what they do. But for some reason, I don't know, kids just seem to get them confused. So let's see if I can sort you out on that and help you so that you're not confused. All right, so your skin tissue, also called your epithelial tissue, is um, lining your organs cavities, and even little tubules in your body. So you have skin in the game pretty much everywhere. Now what makes this interesting is epithelial tissue can make those ACE2 receptors that invite the COVID virus inside. So people are looking at the uh, epithelial tissue a little more closely to figure out if this is why some people start having strokes when they get COVID. So anyway, uh, the shapes of your epithelial tissues are squamous, and we, we saw that in uh, chapter one, I believe, and cuboidal, which means in a cube or a square, and columnar, which are tall and look like columns. So this should not be a problem. I mean, square cells, rectangular cells, or cells that are smashed as flat as a potato chip. So here, here we're going to start looking at some of those. If you have just one layer, for example, here's the, um, the sacs in your lung that make up the alveoli. They're one cell layer thick. Other places you have many layers. So that would be stratified. Stratified means in layers. So we have simple, which is just one layer, and stratified, which is multiple layers. So we're going to start out with simple squamous epithelium. And you'd think we start on the outside of the body, but the most interesting, I think, of all the uh, squamous cells are the ones that make up these grape-like sacs. They look like a grape cluster. It helps to see what the alveolar sacs look like when they're not sliced open. So these are one layer of the squamous epithelial cells. And then on the outside of it, in blue and in red, you see the capillaries that are helping to exchange oxygen and carbon dioxide. And we're going to learn that capillaries are also one cell layer thick. So if you've got one cell layer of blood vessel laying up against one cell layer of lung sac, then you can see that it's easy, especially since they're flat, for the gases to exchange across from one to the other. So try to imagine those sacs when you see this. This is a cross section through the sac. And each one of these little arrows is one cell right there. And each one of the cells has a nucleus. So you can kind of see the nucleus, see the nucleus, see the nucleus. So this is how you detect them. This is how you see them. And then you need to know where they are. So you've got them in your lungs. You've got them lining your blood vessels. So you've got them a number of 
places in your body. And their main function, or one of their main functions, is to exchange gases, oxygen and carbon dioxide. And so these little dark bumps that you see, that's where the DNA is staining darker in the little flat cells. Cuboidal cells are the ones that are square or cube shaped and they almost always are in a single file like this although sometimes you will have a double layer of them so they are you can find them stratified but we're only looking at the simple or one layered areas and this one happens to be in the kidney tubules so any place that you're going to be absorbing or secreting you're going to probably find these square or cuboidal cells. So they're almost always around a lumen. We call this opening a lumen. And you're going to find that we have sweat glands that have these also. So anything that squirts or absorbs, think simple cuboidal epithelial cells. So its function, absorb and secrete. Again, they want you to see the nucleus. In these, the nucleus is almost perfectly round. It's not smashed like it was in the squamous. The columnar cells are a little bit harder, but if you look carefully, let's see if I can blow that up a little bit for you. Here you go. Now you can see each individual columnar cell. So there's one, there's one, here's one. And the nuclei are kind of made oval because these are more of a column instead of a cube. So you're going to find them to be elongated like this. And they're generally pretty much in a row. See, these are nicely in a row right through there. These columnar cells are lining the villi in the jejunum of the small intestine. So when we get into the intestines, we're going to find that the small intestines are divided up into uh, different segments. So this happens to be the jejunum. And some of the things to look for are these things. There's one arrow there. There's one. Here's one. These are called goblet cells, and it's literally a sack full of mucus. So if you think about the food that you eat, and it has to slide through your intestines. So if you don't make enough mucus, if you don't make enough snot-like substance, then the food, the bolus of food that you're trying to move through your intestines can get stuck. And this is never a good thing. So you need plenty of goblet cells and you need plenty of mucus to keep everything smoothly flowing along. Now, the other thing that they want you to look at is three on the surface of each of these finger-like projections. Here's one finger-like projection. Here's one finger-like projection, which is called a villus. There are microvilli. So I went to the electron micrograph picture, and here you go. I don't know about you guys, but my Alexa periodically just starts playing random songs or talking about random things, even when I don't mention her name or ask her to do something. So anyway, back to what I was talking about. I went out and I found you a picture of microvilli. But if you notice, you have to go to 20,000 times magnification. And remember, our light microscopes only go up to 1,000, even when you're using oil immersion. So you really can't see the microvilli. So in your lab, you just kind of have to take it on faith that they're there. But the reason that we have microvilli sticking out from our villi is to increase the surface area. So as the food comes down the intestines, it percolates through these little finger-like projections, which are on top of other finger-like projections here and you absorb a lot of the nutrients. 
So you want to slow it down and you want it to have a lot of surface area so that you can absorb nutrients. So that's why it's important to know the microvilli are there, but you have to almost take it on faith because you sure as heck can't see them except for they stain just a little bit darker right there. So anyway, one of the things that they want you to know are make sure that you know your microvilli, your nucleus, and the goblet cells. Now that doesn't look like any goblet I ever saw. And all the goblets that I drink out of don't have mucus in them, but I didn't name them. Now this slide is easy to confuse with the slide before. If you, if you look at it. So it has the columnar cells, but they're pseudostratified epithelium, pseudostratified columnar epithelium. So pseudo means fake. Stratified means in layers. So this is actually one layer, but because it's kind of smooshed up and the nuclei are smooshed up and down, it looks like there's more than one layer there, but it is just one layer. So let's blow that up a little bit for you. Let's see if we can get that. All right, now this actually has cilia sticking up there, little hair-like projections. Now before, those were villi sticking up, but these are hair-like projections and they can move, they can wave. So these are lining your trachea, that's your windpipe. And their function is to move mucus. Now, the interesting thing, so you see more goblet cells, so you're going to know that you're going to be making some, some mucus, some snot in through there. But these, you would think that these would wave down towards the lungs, but they actually wave up towards your Adam's apple, towards your windpipe to your voice box. Now, in people who don't smoke, as you sleep at night, mucus is secreted, and these little cilia actually push the mucus upward. And then it makes it up to where your trachea and your esophagus meet around your voice box, and the mucus and any debris, any spores, viruses, worms, anything like that that you happen to have gotten into your windpipe will stick to the sticky mucus and then the cilia will push it up, up, up and then it'll go down into your esophagus and into your stomach where it's digested or neutralized. Now if you're a smoker it paralyzes these. So when you make mucus all the mucus that you're making can't move because the cilia can't push forward, and so it slides down into your lungs. It gets down into your bronchial tubes and down into your lungs. And I'm sure you've heard somebody who has a smoker's cough. A person with a smoker's cough will wake up in the morning, and they, they start coughing up phlegm. Well, this is because all the mucus all night long is running down, instead of being pushed out by the cilia. And if you've been smoking for a long time, and you look at the trachea, if they put a little tube down your throat and look to see this, you don't even have cilia. They don't even bother making it because as fast as they make it, you've got all that toxic substance in your cigarette that causes them literally not to form. So anyway, if you need a reason not to smoke, there's a good one. Here's a really cool video that I made a while back. This is actually the cilia right here. And there are white blood cells, dust particles, spores. In case you need a good laugh, here's the opening to your trachea. <laughs> so in case you were falling asleep, I just threw in a laugh to wake you up a little bit. So 
This is actually one cell. Here's another cell and another cell. There's the basement membrane that they're sitting on. And then there's the top of them with the cilia. And there's the goblet cells. But because it's scrunched up, the nuclei, nuclei, one's up here, one's down there, and so on like that. So it looks like multiple layers when it's only one. So pseudo-stratified columnar, because they're tall columns, epithelium with cilia. Their function is to move mucus, and you need to know these three things. So don't get this one mixed up with this one. They're also a different magnification, which is also a little awkward. But these have microvilli, which are actually extensions off of the cells. And these have cilia, which are hair-like structures that wave. They do the wave up towards your voice box which is where that lady was laughing. This is a picture of stratified squamous epithelium. So this is your lining your mouth, lining your esophagus, inside your cheeks, and various other places. On the surface, there's the flattened ones, and then there's another layer of flattened ones underneath, and then some that aren't quite so flattened. So you can actually see the nucleus. So as you see, they go down from being completely squamous and flat to almost looking cuboidal. And then this almost looks like pseudostratified. But this area is called stratified squamous epithelium, and it is a protection from abrasion and infection. So anything that's trying to invade your body is going to have to make it through all these layers, past all these cells, before it can actually get to some place where there's a blood vessel where it can jump into your body. The other thing is you're constantly sloughing off these. So if you pee in a cup and you look in the cup, at the bottom of the cup are going to be a whole lot of epithelial cells that you peed out in your urine. So you're constantly sloughing them off. And it's nice because you have a thick layer of them that you can slough off. So think about uh, when you skin your knee and you tear off those layers of skin and now you have blood oozing out and you, it's very painful. You have exposed nerve endings. So by having a thicker layer here, you can tear off these dead cells, tear off these dead cells, tear off these dead cells before you get down to where the nerves are and it actually hurts. So protection from abrasion and from infection is the function of the stratified squamous epithelium, the layers and layers that align your mouth, your esophagus, and other places. And again, you need to know something. So there's the nuclei. So there's some... But here are the ones right there on the true squamous epithelium. Because remember, squamous means squished flat. Now you have something that they call transitional epithelium. And here's the lumen of something. In this one, it says it's the uh, ureter or the bladder where they've taken this section. And anywhere you need the tissue to be able to stretch considerably, you're going to have transitional epithelium. So uh, inside of a man's penis, you definitely want transitional epithelium because it's going to go from one size to another. Your bladder, when it's empty, shrivels up. And then you fill it and fill it and fill it with urine until you get the urge and you have to run and uh, empty it out. So its function is to be elastic, to stretch, and to recoil. I like this picture of transitional epithelium uh, a little bit better than the one that's in your book. But if you take columnar cells, 
that are all nice and a rectangular and in a row, and you squish them together, it kind of looks like a peacock's tail to me. Have you ever seen a peacock? So you've got kind of the rounded top right there. There you go. That's a little bit better so you can see it. And there's the nuclei all squished together. So if you see something that looks like a peacock's tail, there's the basement membrane right there. You know that this is going to be able to stretch. You know this is transitional epithelium. So if you look closely at this picture, you can kind of see that peacock looking stuff right there. For those taking this course in person, we're going to have a box of slides and you're actually going to look at a, a cross section of a lung. So you can look at the simple squamous epithelium. You can look at it at 4x, 10x, and 40x and draw what the alveoli look like at each of the magnifications. And then we have the simple cuboidals. So there's a cut out of the kidney. And the kidney, of course, secretes. Uh, we know that. You've got uh, you're absorbing stuff out of the kidneys and returning it to the body, and you're secreting stuff into the kidneys. And then you have hormones that the, that the kidney does. So we'll talk more about the kidney later on. But you're just supposed to be able to identify cuboidal. Remember, they're going to be in a circle around a hole, and the hole is called a lumen, L-U-M-E-N. And look at it at 4, 10, and 40. And then the simple columnar, same deal. The pseudo-stratified columnar, which is the trachea. So remember what the trachea had on it? It has the little hair-like things. They get the mucus out, unless you're a smoker. And then it lets it pool in your lungs and you cough it up when you wake up in the morning. And transitional epithelium, anywhere you've got a stretch. They're really columnar cells, but they are so scrunched up that they look like a peacock's tail. All right, now we're getting it into connective tissue. So there's four types of tissue. There's muscle, nerve, the epithelial, which we just did, and then everything that doesn't fit as a muscle, a nerve, or skin is going to be thrown into the connective tissue. So it's just going to be a hodgepodge of different things. One of the things that they want you to look for are fibroblasts, lymphoblasts, adipocytes, collagen fibers, and elastic fibers. So one of the things that connective tissue has is a matrix. So there's the cell, but it's going to secrete something or have something outside of it besides just the cells. So when we talk about blood, you know that there are cells in the blood, but you also know there's plasma. Now, if you really got down and looked at the plasma, there's all kinds of proteins and hormones and waste and dissolved gases. So it has a matrix, a liquid matrix. But the ones we're going to talk about have either collagen or elastic or collagen and elastic as their matrix. So here's one of the first ones. This one should be fairly easy. I mean, this doesn't look like any of the cuboidals or the columnar or the squamous. If you were going to confuse this with anything, you might think, well, that might be the lung, the squamous. But you don't see the nice grape-like clusters. So this is not lung tissue. This is areolar connective tissue. And the first time I saw that, it kind of took me aback. I was like, oh, wait a minute. The areola is that little colored circle around the nipple. So what is this talking about? Well, surrounding almost every organ in your body and underneath all of your skin is areolar connective tissue. So it's kind of a loose mesh of elastic uh, fibers, collagen fibers, and reticular fibers. So you have all, dis all different kinds. The bigger, fatter ones are collagen. The 
um, skinnier ones. And a lot of times they're wrinkled. Let's see if we can find some wrinkled ones. There you go. There's some wrinkled ones. Those are the elastic ones. So they're a little, they allow your skin to be a little bit stretchy. And then you have fibroblast. So you have little bitty cells in there that are making these fibers. Here's a close-up of the areolar tissue. And one of the cells that they don't mention, but I think is really important for you to know, inside this loose connective tissue, this areolar tissue, there's your elastic, here's your collagen, there's your fibroblasts that are making these fibers. But this is called a mast cell. They're large, and look at all these little sacs inside there. Those are little bags of heparin and histamine. So if I were to walk over to a student and lose my mind and slap them, these would degranulate, the histamine would be released, and fluid would rush into the area. And looking at the student's face, you would actually see the imprint of my hand because I would have caused all of the mast cells in the areolar connective tissue to degranulate and release the histamine. So it would be red, inflamed, and you could actually see my individual fingers where I caused these to degranulate. So I think that mast cells are interesting, and I do not condone the beating up of students or children, but in the case of talking about hypothetical situations, you've probably seen where someone got hit and it swelled up. And this is why. So if you want the swelling to go down, you take an antihistamine. So this is important. What if instead of getting slapped, the person got stung by a bee? Well, then you'd have the degranulation of the mast cell in the area where the person got stung or a splinter went in, and it'll swell up because fluids will rush in because of the histamine, and the blood will not clot because of the heparin that's being released in that area, and it gives the uh, white blood cells a chance to come in and fix things or to take away the dead cells that were injured when the person got stung or hit or bitten or whatever happened. So where do you find it? Surrounding organs and underneath all of your skin. And its function is to wrap, it's like a soft uh, bubble wrap around different things, to cushion them, to hold them in place has defensive cells in there, so there's going to also be, we haven't learned about the immune system, but there are defensive cells in there, and it holds fluids, and it can cause histamine release, which will bring other fluid into the area. So that's some of the functions of it, and it has the collagen, the elastic, and the reticular fibers, and we're going to learn about reticular fibers in just a second. And you should know about collagen. Uh, first of all, it's not spelled that way. That one's a typo. It's spelled like this, C-O-L-L-A-G-E-N, and elastic and the fibroblast. So those are the things that they want you to see. All right, now we're getting into reticular connective tissue. Now, if you remember from another lab, we talked about endoplasmic reticulum, and it looks like ladies' purses or fishnet stockings. Now, you're going to have to... to um, use your imagination a little bit. Let's see if we can blow this up, make it any better. But also this is several layers thick, so it's kind of hard to see. But you can sort of see, here's kind of like a cell, uh, not a cell, individual cell, but a, a chamber. Or what would you call the fishnet stocking? What would you call each of those little holes in the fishnet stocking? So here's, here's one of those. Here's one right there. And they're not uniform. They're not completely uniform. But if you look, you can sort of see them. And hanging off of them, 
hanging off of this reticular uh, fibers are um, immune cells, lymphoblast. So here we go. You have the dark staining reticular fibers. You have the openings and then inside the openings hanging down you have lymphoblast and other cells. If you were ta to take this out, you know, just take a slice out of a person and put it on a slide, it will be brown. So that's one of the characteristics of it. So when you see brown, that's kind of unusual. If you're not looking at skin, you don't usually have a lot of brown tissue. So that should be like a giveaway of what uh, reticular tissue looks like. So it forms a scaffolding, which I say looks like fishnet stockings, and it has reticular fibers. It also has um, um, collagen, but you, the predominant one are the reticular fibers. And then the cells, each of these little brown things in there is a lymphoblast. So it makes up part of your immune system. As far as I know, in the history of all the decades I've been teaching, nobody's missed this cell type. This is fat, also known as adipose connective tissue. Adipose connective tissue. It looks like empty bags. And what you've done is inside there, you have filled it up with so much fat that you can't see the nucleus. You can't see the mitochondria. You can't see anything except for blobs of fat. Now, if you blow it up, I'll make it a little bit bigger here for you. Here and there, you see something squished over to the side. That's actually the nucleus. Now, if you were going to confuse this with anything, you might confuse it with the uh, squamous epithelium of the alveoli of the lungs. But if you remember that, they were a whole series of little cells, one right after the other with a whole series of nuclei. And if you look around the edge of this, there is no nucleus except that which is one squished over to the side. This one, I don't even see a, a nucleus. So it must be on the back side of it somewhere. So only rarely will you see a nucleus, but mostly you just see big bags of fat. Now the sad thing is, after you stop being a baby, you don't make more fat cells. You're done. You have the fat cells you're going to have for life, but you have the ability to fill them up and fill them up and fill them up, bigger and bigger and bigger and fuller and fuller and fuller. So. It's kind of funny when you look at somebody that walks by and they're like 400 pounds and you think, man, that person has the same number of fat cells I do? I don't think so. But they're much more efficient than you are at filling up those cells with fat. All right, so where are we going to find this? All right, you're going to find this underneath your skin, in your breast, around your eyes, and cushioning your kidneys. So it's nice to have a bag of fat cushioning your kidneys. And you're thinking, well, I don't want fat under my skin. Well, you actually do. Because when you get old, you dissolve the fat that's underneath your skin, and now there's nothing to support the skin, and it wrinkles up and shrivels up, and then now you're all wrinkly and funny looking. So, you actually kind of do want layers of fat underneath your skin because it'll stretch your skin out and make your skin look nice and smooth. All right, so there's where you're going to find it, and it functions by storing energy. So you can take that fat and break it down and turn it into sugar, and you can power your body. It is cushioning. So especially your kidneys, you really need your kidneys suspended in a nice soft cushion because your kidneys are very delicate. And the other thing is insulation. 
So um, I tend, I am uh, a little bit overweight. And because of that, I'm almost always overheated. And I very rarely wear a coat. And it always upsets my students to see me walking around in the snow or on ice and I don't have a coat on. So I've had many students offer to get me one from the Salvation Army or somewhere. And I think it's so precious. But when you're fat, you are insulated from the cold. All right, you don't see any fibers. And um, all, all you see are, are, are fat cells <laughs> with a squished nucleus. All right, so now we're going to get into the dense regular and the dense irregular connective tissue. So I'm going to show them to you um, not blown up first, so you can compare and contrast them, and then I'll, I'll blow it up so you can see the details a little bit better. So dense regular, it has the collagen fibers pretty much in a row. They're just one right after the other. You can see the fibers lined up. And you're going to find these in your ligaments and your tendons. So if you're eating a piece of chicken or something like that, unless you bite into a gristle, this is probably what you bit into, something like this. So you, it's collagen. And you're going to have little fibroblasts along there that are laying down these collagen uh, fibers through there. Now, one of the students said, oh, Miss Drake, I don't have any trouble telling the difference between the dense regular and the dense irregular because this looks like you took this and dropped it and broke it. So if you've got the collagen fibers going every which way, that's dense, irregular connective tissue. Dense, irregular. So again, you have collagen fibers, just like you have collagen fibers here. You have fibroblasts, which are sometimes visible and sometimes not visible. And it is found in the dermis of the skin. So we haven't learned the layers of the skin, but we're going to get into that. You've got your epidermis on the outside, your dermis, that's in the middle, and then your hypodermis, which is the fat layer underneath. So you're going to find this kind of tissue in the dermis because you need your skin to be able to stretch. Just think about when you open and close your hand, how, how much you're stretching your skin. So if you had this kind of tissue right there, it doesn't give. I don't want my knee to be wobbly. I don't want my arm to pop out of its socket. I want really strong um, tissue to hold that in place. But I don't want really strong tissue holding my skin in my hands and places like that. So that's why you would have the different uh, types. Now let's blow this up a little bit and you can see. So here you can see the fibers a little bit better. You can see the fibers. And then buried in the fibers, there you go, there and there and there are the cells, the fibroblasts that are actually laying down more, <clears throat> excuse me, more and more of this stuff. So there you go. For the next tissue, if you've ever had somebody stick your arm uh, to draw blood, and then afterwards, instead of putting a Band-Aid on, they take a little bit of this stuff and wrap it around. That's what this tissue looks like to me. So this is elastic connective tissue, and it's got collagen and of course, it's got elastic fibers in it also. This particular section of elastic connective tissue is taken out of the aorta. So if you stop and think about your heart, it fills up with blood, and then when it squeezes, it forces the blood out through the aorta with enough force 
that it will go through the aorta and branch out and go to the rest of the body. So it takes quite a bit of force, and the aorta has to be able to stretch every time that big burst of blood pushes its way into the aorta. So it is very elastic, it is very stretchy, but to me that looks just like that stuff that they put on after they draw your blood. So anyway, that might help you. It also has fibroblast. Anytime you've got collagen or elastic fibers or reticular fibers, you have to have fibroblasts to lay them down. You have to have little cells to do that. So let's see if we can blow this up a little bit. And if you didn't know that's what you were looking at, you would just kind of think that was a shadow. But there is a fibroblast, and it's laying down these uh, elastic and collagen fibers. So... When you see something like that, think, oh, that looks like that stuff they put on after they, they do a, a venipuncture. So elastic connective tissue, and its function is to be elastic. It's kind of good. And the example that they give you is the aorta. But, of course, you've got elastic connective tissue other places in your body. For those taking the class in person, you're going to get out your microscope. You're going to look at areolar loose connective tissue at 4x, 10x, and 40x, which would be 40 magnification, 100 magnification, and 400 magnification. And you're going to label the fibroblast, the collagen fibers, and the elastic fibers. And then there's the reticular connective tissue, the adipose connective tissue, the dense regular connective tissue, and the dense irregular connective tissue and elastic connective tissue. So here's a nice little table and you can draw what these look like, whether or not there's any layers. When it says simple, there are not layers. Any special features? Well, the special feature about squamous is they are smushed flat and they have a little teeny tiny nucleus poking up almost kind of like a fried egg if you can see a fried egg the yolk would be the nucleus and then the white would be the rest of the cell and you have the squamous epithelium you're going to put the functions where you're going to find it and then go on and fill out your table right there and that'll make it a quick and dirty study guide and it'll say okay do you really remember where this stuff is and what kind of fibers do you see? Do you just see collagen? Do you see elastic? Do you see elastic and collagen? Do you see reticular fibers? And that's it for this chapter.